All right. So uh, welcome to the CBITS webinar uh, and being held in conjunction with the Society for Digital Mental Health. Um, so once we get started, um, and I'll, I'll introduce uh, Sarah Becker here in a moment, uh, but once we get started, please go ahead and put your questions in during the talk and, and into the Q&A, and I'll read them off at the end. Um, I wanted to just, before we get started, uh, you know, thank everybody for uh, completing the survey. So I wanted to just take a moment and give you the results of the survey that, that people filled out uh, a few weeks ago. So I'll just share my screen here. So, um, you know, this is who the, 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 the people coming to uh, the webinar are. So not surprisingly, about half are academic faculty and researchers and about a quarter are students, but around 10% are from industry, around uh, 10 from healthcare and then other. Uh, and the other includes a few people from the federal government, from law, uh, some staff people and some professional organizations. Uh, and then the other reason that we uh, sent the survey out was to, you know, think about what we want, what people wanted for uh, upcoming, uh, you know, upcoming talks. Um, and how do I advance this here? Um, so this is the results of what people wanted. So, um, you know, close to 90% were interested in clinical science, which is not surprising. Uh, another 70% for design. Uh, and the, the other top ones around 63% for policy, around 60% for digital health. And this is sort of more broadly like disease management, obesity. And so this is something we haven't done. And so we will look at starting to include more than just mental health, but also more sort of digital health. Uh, and then you can see here what some of the others, uh, what the others are, computer science, industry, health economics. But I also want to uh, mention here some of the suggestions. So implementation science, we will be doing some of that today. Um, you know, more talks on diversity uh, and applications in community settings, on accessibility, um, regulation and funding. And then uh, somebody also mentioned uh, continuing education credits, and that's something that we can uh, we can look into uh, providing next year. I'm I'm not entirely sure if we'll be able to do that. Uh, a number of people also asked whether they're uh, whether they can get recordings, and we do post the recordings. So uh, if if for uh, speakers who agree to have their their um, talks recorded, uh, they are on the CBITS website uh, under under seminars. I'll put I'll put a link into the chat uh, once we once we get started. So, um, so thank you for filling out that survey. And uh, now we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we are, you know, I'm really happy to have Sarah Becker here talking with us. Sarah joined Northwestern uh, last fall. She came from Brown and she came here to Northwestern to direct the center, open, found, and, and direct the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science. And she has, uh, you know, her, her broad interest really is in understanding how to make that bridge between research and practice. Uh, and, and she works in a lot of different areas, but her own research, I think, is centered largely in the area of, of substance abuse. And I think, I think that's what you're going to be talking about today. So without, uh, without further ado, Sarah. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. It's lovely to see some of the names of participants coming in, a lot of uh, friendly names and familiar names, even though I can't see familiar faces. Um, but thank you so much for having me here today. It's really an honor uh, to be here. It's a little bit intimidating to come after someone from Google. That was a really exciting talk a couple of weeks ago, um, but just thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to speak with you about how to increase the uptake of effective treatments for youth um, via scalable digital health interventions and strategies. Uh, this is not a topic that I talk about often. I talk often about how to increase the uptake of effective treatment, um, but this talk today really challenged me to think about how could we use digital health both as a highly scalable intervention that is 
readily implementable, as well as part of your actual implementation strategy and your efforts to get something implemented into usual care. So I had a lot of fun making this talk and I hope that we have fun together. All right, so I have some goals of what I'd like to cover today. First, I'm gonna give you an overview of the what, why, and how of dissemination and implementation science so that we have some common language and frameworks for the rest of our time together. And I'm really gonna challenge us in that early part of the conversation to really think about how does the field of implementation science intersect with the field of digital health and what are some key points of contact and synergy that we can think about to push this work forward. Then I'm gonna take a deep dive into case examples. I'll talk about two. One specifically that was to create a scalable intervention uh, for youth uh, with substance use. And the second, which was to actually create a platform uh, for HIV service providers to integrate screening into their usual care. And that, in that one, the technology was really part of our implementation strategy and not necessarily the intervention itself. And then I'm gonna end by talking about some resources and give you a shameless, very brief plug about our new center. So without further ado, let's jump in. So dissemination and implementation science, which you'll also hear me refer to as DNI science for short, let's talk about the what, why, and how. So what exactly do I mean when I say DNI science? In lay terms, I like to think about dissemination and implementation science as bridging the gap between what we know in terms of public health and medical knowledge and what we actually do in terms of public health and medical practice. And I and our new center have been really intentional in articulating that even though we often talk about this as bridging the gap, it's really multiple interrelated gaps that we have to address in tandem. I also think it's really important to explicitly note that activities to bridge the gap must be proactive, they must be intentional, and we really have to center equity to make certain that we're not simply increasing access to treatment for those that already are most likely to receive it, but that we're really thinking about equity as part of our implementation science activities. So the National Institute of Health at and just be, a, be reassured, I just showed you some circles and gaps. I'm gonna talk about each of those in turn in a moment. First, I'm gonna give you the high level view of how the National Institute of Health defines dissemination and implementation science or the D and the I. Dissemination research is defined as the scientific study of how to distribute information and material to a specific audience or public health practice. Um, I like to think of this with my um, economics hat on in a former life. I was an economics and psychology major. And so I like to think of dissemination research as research broadly to increase the demand for effective health services. We can think of this as addressing a specific gap that I will call the public health demand gap, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, implementation research, on the other hand, is much more context specific. This is the study of the use of strategies to integrate a specific innovation or health service into a specific context or setting. Again, with our economic hat on, this is work to increase the supply of effective treatment out in community settings, and I would argue it helps us to address our public health supply gap. Uh, why do we need this type of research? Why are these gaps important? I like to answer that with a visual metaphor of the behavioral health treatment system, which is actually a photo that my husband and I took on a helicopter tour of the uh, Grand Canyon many years ago. Um, and I love this picture and this metaphor because what you see is one enormous canyon, but it's not just one singular thing. It's made up of multiple adjacent gaps that combine together to form something of a really grand scale. And I think our health system's like that too. It's not one singular gap that we're addressing, but multiple problems, silos, issues that we are addressing in tandem. So let's talk about those gaps that I teed up for us in the bridge picture before. The first gap is what I would call the public health supply gap, that in lay terms is really the gap between the care that could be available if we used our best public health and medical knowledge versus the care that actually is available in the community. I think most of you that attend this seminar, I probably don't need to convince that this is a big issue, but if I needed to, there's a trio of landmark Institute of Medicine reports that really document this gap and they actually call it crossing the quality chasm. And I just love this word, um, chasm, in one, because I, serious wordler, and chasm is a fabulous wordle word, but also um, because it really, again, gets at the enormity of the problem. It's not simply a gap, it's a chasm. Like this is, this is something of immense magnitude. And these reports by the Institute of Medicine document 
the scope of this gap between what we know and what's actually available. And it also notes that this gap tends to be even greater for the treatment of mental health and substance use conditions because of a number of unique barriers in those systems, such as the stigma associated um, with providing care and receiving care. And there are also some statistics I like to highlight right up front. One is that it takes 17 years to turn 14% of in original research to the benefit of patients. Often when I present that statistic, people are like, wait, 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 what does that mean? It means that 86% of our research does not help patients and that the research that does help patients on average takes 17 years. This should alarm you, it alarms me, um, and it suggests that we really need to be working to accelerate the impact of our treatment. I also love this quote by Fixon and colleagues, that effective interventions without implementation strategies is like a serum without a syringe. The cure is available, but the delivery system is not. And I view that quote as a really nice reminder that it's not enough to just create beautiful, elegant, effective treatments. We have to be really intentional about thinking about how are we going to get those interventions out into the community so that we're not just creating um, serums without syringes, but that we're really creating the whole package. All right, so gap two, this is what I would call the public health demand gap. This is the gap between those who need treatment and those who seek any treatment at all. This doesn't even get into whether that treatment is effective, but if we just look broadly at the percent of Americans that meet full diagnostic criteria for a specific issue who receive any health services at all, my goal in this slide is simply to show you that the number should be 100% or at least pretty close to it, and they're not. For a substance use disorder, only about one in five or 20% of people will seek any services. That's even lower if you work with youth. It's usually about five to 8%. Um, for mental health, less than half of people will seek any services, those with HIV, of only about two-thirds, those with a physical disability of high impairment, only about 70% will seek any services at all. Um, and when you peel back the layers of the onion and look at who is getting services, the level of unmet need is greatest among those with lower education, lower socioeconomic status, and from historically underserved groups. So really those that we most want to be reaching with our interventions are the least likely to receive any care at all. Um, so again, the public health demand gap is a huge part of the issue. I like to just always note that if you think about the COVID vaccine rollout as just a really salient example, um, I think that's a great example of how you need both sides of the coin. You need to address the supply gap, you need to get shots out into the community, but you also need to get people out to actually seek the vaccine and to go and get the vaccine. So you need to be addressing demand. And I would argue that our government did a pretty decent job on the supply side, getting shots out into community. We didn't really address demand. We didn't think about how to address medical mistrust. We didn't think about how to increase knowledge and awareness in the communities that most needed it. And so our efforts fell short. So I would argue we really need to be doing both things in tandem. All right, and then very briefly, there are two other gaps that I think are critical to address. One I would call the expertise capacity gap, and one I would call the scientific or methodological gap. That's basically what I'm trying to say here is that the field of implementation research is relatively young. Um, I attended the first NIH Training Institute in Implementation Science in 2011. Um, the fields or the frameworks have only been around for about 15 to 20 years. I mean, many people have been doing this work for a long time, but the actual field has really only coalesced in the last couple decades. Um, and so what you see on this visual here is one example from one funding institute, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They did enormous investment in addressing the opioid stimulant epidemic in the last five years of 2015 to 2019. And what I just want to highlight was a detailed analysis of all their funded grants suggested only 1.5% or what we would constitute as implementation research. So this field is wide open. Um, there's still not a lot of implementation research. There are not a lot of implementation researchers. So one of the things I hope our new center will address is really addressing this expertise capacity gap, promoting training and education, and helping to build the workforce. So if you are listening and you are interested in this field but haven't leaned in yet, we need you. Um, we really could use your talent. And so I'm happy to talk with folks after this presentation if we can help woo you into this field. So why do we, so like what is, what are some of the status quo issues that perpetuate these gaps? One is that we have a very linear and slow model of how we conduct research. We typically start with what to target, then after we do our pre-intervention studies, we think about 
Now, does it work under highly rigorous conditions? Then does it work in the real world? And only at the last phase do we really think about how do we deliver this? How do we get it into the system? The argument I'm going to be making today and that many in the field of implementation science would make is that we should be thinking about that final step throughout the process. We should be thinking about how to deliver, how to design for scale, you know, how to work within the context, contextual barriers that we face to actually be creating things right up front that have better potential to be adopted. So usually this is where I talk about the how of dissemination and implementation research. So I'm gonna tee this up and then I'm gonna challenge us to think about points of intersection with digital health. So the how of dissemination and implementation research I think is easiest to think about when you think about first the status quo. So the status quo, we typically think about a specific health service or innovation and we think about its effect on patient outcomes like symptoms, like functioning, or their health status. What that ignores is a heck of a lot of contextual variables around, like what is the climate where we're delivering this? What are the policies at that time that might support that intervention or health services being adopted in routine care? Who are the people that are gonna deliver it? It also ignores the strategies that we would use to actually get that into practice. Like, do people need training? Do we need to provide incentives for them to deliver this service? Like what types of specific strategies are needed? It also ignores a host of important outcomes. Like is this feasible for people? Can they deliver it with fidelity? Um, what does it cost to deliver it? And a whole host of service outcomes. Like is it efficient? Is it patient-centered? And is it timely? All of these variables in the middle and around the perimeter are what we would say is the core of BNI research. So I really, in preparation for the talk, was just trying to think about what are some points of intersection here with digital health? And the first is that it's been well documented there are unique barriers and facilitators to digital health that might not exist for other tools. For one, you know, is tech support available for the tool? What is the digital literacy of the population that you wanna work with? You know, does that population have specific concerns about privacy or confidentiality? There might be specific facilitators as well, such as teenagers that are chronically on their uh, smartphones. So these are all things to think about when thinking about designing a roadmap for your service. Also, our intervention becomes different as opposed to a health service that's delivered by a human. You know, suddenly we have a suite of digital tools that can help us to increase the reach potentially of the services that we're creating. The strategies themselves differ too. So for implementation strategies, there's a whole host of strategies that we often talk about. A common taxonomy you'll hear was the experts for recommending implementation change, um, or inter I'm sorry, it's the ERIC taxonomy. Um, but there are unique strategies for digital health tools, like you might need a strategy to identify patients that need this tool. You might need a referral mechanism um, in your healthcare system. You also might want to think about these outcomes in a slightly different way. How you think about the fidelity of intervention of the intervention might be a little bit different in a digital tool, and you might actually think about the fidelity of delivering it to the person or getting them to the app as opposed to fidelity within the app itself. You also might think of your service outcomes a little bit different in terms of how you measure efficiency or timeliness. Um, these are areas that actually some wonderful leaders at CBIS have really been pushing the needle forward on. So I just want to share that if that's something that interests you, um, David, who was here, and his team, um, Andrea Graham, Emily Laddie, and others have really published thinking about what are some unique implementation strategies for digital mental health interventions. And also some colleagues, um, Steve Schuler with formerly of CBIS as well, um, has really pushed forward our thinking of how do we recharacterize our established outcomes. So this is an area that I think is really exciting and right for us to be thinking about. I'm gonna spend the rest of our time talking about two case examples from my own work that have gotten me thinking about this intersection of digital health and implementation science. And first is one that I think is a little bit easier to maybe wrap our heads around. And it's just, how do you think about designing a scalable, highly implementable digital health intervention right up front? Um, this was a project that took place in partnership with an adolescent residential facility that provided both substance use and mental health care. Um, the rationale for this study was that adolescents in residential have the most serious problems and functional impairment um, as opposed to other levels of care. But, and uh, the good news is that recovery is possible, but the, and the bad news is that ongoing support is really critical to maintaining that recovery and people tend not to use it. <laughs> so residential treatments associated with in encouraging reductions in substance use and co-occurring mental health symptoms, but the long-term results really tend to fall short. We see that about half of adolescents relapse within the first three months of discharge, in part because alarmingly, 
only 35 to 45 percent of youth that just had a residential stay will receive any continuing care at all. So there's a big gap between continuing care need and continuing care receipt. And so we really wanted to try to think about how to address that. There was a call by the residential care consortium that residential facilities should really prioritize parent engagement and that noting that parents are a key part to that recovery puzzle. Um, and there is another place where engaging parents is immensely difficult. So we really wanted to tackle this and think, can we design a scalable parenting intervention that would really help adolescents with that continuing care challenge and the fact that so many adolescents fall through the cracks during continuing care. So rather than recreate something ourselves, we looked to the literature and we said, hey, are there effective health services that exist? And there was one. There was a highly scalable program called Parenting Wisely. It's an interactive parenting program that programs can purchase for their patients or patients can purchase for themselves. It's about $30 uh, per license fee, but you can get a discount if you bulk order. And this has been shown to improve parental monitoring and communication, which are two key processes that are associated with adolescent outcomes after residential treatment. And it's also been shown um, to improve the, the youth actual, their behavior themselves, but with a focus on behavior problems and not on substance use or mental health. So we thought, okay, maybe we could just offer this to people and see if that would help. But we started by doing formative research with parents, with teens, and with residential staff, just to ask, hey, if we were to offer this to you, would that be something that you'd even be interested in that you would consider using? And we heard some interesting themes. Um, and this work was done ages ago as part of my K-23, um, which was funded back in 2012. This was something I was actually doing for another purpose. I was doing qualitative research um, to try and improve the marketing of treatment. But I, when I was doing that type of research in a residential facility, I started hearing all this need um, from parents about this mismatch between when they wanted treatment and when they were getting it. So that sparked us to really think, oh, could we improve this service point here where we're hearing all these pain points? Could we actually help this population? So we started by just talking to people, which is what I think often we should do in research more. Um, and we heard some really interesting things. We heard people really wanted guided delivery. Parents were saying, I am a dinosaur with technology. If you just give me an app, I will not use it. I need you to hold my hand and really teach me how to use it, show me how to use it until I get a certain level of comfort. People also really, really wanted to connect with parents. Um, some of our work was actually done in focus group formats, and parents were saying in the group, this is what I want. I want more of this, more opportunity to connect with other parents. People were also saying, I don't want to wait uh, once a week to have to go in and talk to someone. I want advice when I need it. People were also saying they wanted to be reminded to use the app, so they wanted push notifications and daily text messages. Um, privacy was very important. And they really wanted this to start while their team was in residential. And then we heard some very unique strategies to implement from the staff themselves. They were saying, like, we really think this need would need to be um, integrated into our intake process and would be something that would happen right up front that we would initially uh, target and be able to identify families that would benefit from this and just routinely offer this as part of um, the intake or else this won't happen. So we did a very small study and this was funded by an R34 a few years back um, where first we were just seeing, okay, could we build something that parents might like? So what we did was we developed an app that was very simple. It just had two forums. It had an ask an expert forum where parents could ask any type of questions to parents and a forum where they could connect with other parents. This, um, and it also had daily tips of the day where parents got links to the videos that were from that Parenting Wisely off-the-shelf program. So there was very little we had to create here. We were basically just bringing people together and connecting them with an expert. So spatially speaking, our initial app really fit here. This is a framework from the paper I showed you earlier about recharacterized outcomes. Um, this was a guided behavioral intervention technology uh, product. Um, the reason I also circled fully automated is that when I think about this product from the perspective of a residential facility, it was very clear to me that residential staff could not take this on. There was no way that they could bill for parental services easily. Um, they really weren't motivated to do this. So it needed to be automated from their perspective. They needed to be able to purchase an off-the-shelf product. So it is guided in the sense that if an agency were to purchase this product, they get access to a coach. But the vision for the business model is that it is automated from the perspective of the residential facility. Fun sidebar, when I was submitting um, a follow-up grant to this, the NIH actually required me to make a business plan before they would fund this. Uh, the services research branch chief said, you know, we're not funding digital health unless there's a business plan um, for how to do this. So happy to talk about that in the Q&A because that was um, something that I thought 
it was really interesting to see that focus on scalability. So this was an R34, as I mentioned. Our aims were really to see, was this feasible? Was it acceptable? To see if it helped parents and if we had a sense that it was actually targeting the parenting processes we thought. Um, this is a consort diagram. The takeaway is that um, we had to assess 209 to randomize 61. And the, the main reason people were excluded is they had no history of use. This is a busy numbers slide. What I want to emphasize here are that these are happy numbers. So this was a grant where we actually pre-specified goals. We said, we will believe this is feasible if a certain number of parents enroll, if a certain number of parents are retained, if a certain number of parents post, and we met or exceeded all of our benchmarks. So my takeaway number is that, I'm sorry, my takeaway message was that we were exceeding all our benchmarks. We had good signs that this was feasible and acceptable to parents. I think the most happy numbers on the slide were that parents that got this very light touch intervention were much more satisfied with their overall experience of residential care than parents who didn't. Um, so that alone, when I spoke to the residential chief medical officer, was enough that he said, we really want to offer this to all our parents because this light touch thing that doesn't cost a lot of money, you know, makes them more satisfied and more likely to recommend our residential treatment to a friend. These are some graphs just showing our preliminary effectiveness outcomes. The takeaway was that this light, very light touch intervention for parents, we saw that teens whose parents got it did better in terms of their days of drinking and also their school related problems over time. We also looked at a host of parenting outcomes and we did this both with questionnaires and by watching parents and teens interact and coding their interactions. We saw lovely interactions exactly the way that we would want to see the parent communication, limit setting, parents' um, ways that they told teens about their substance use beliefs, the way adolescents were disclosing, the way parents um, were monitoring, all improved over time. So this was a really successful pilot project, which led us to apply for an R01. It is now funded as what's called an R37, which is a mechanism that NIDA makes eligible for 10 years of funding, which is hugely exciting. Um, but basically, we were successfully funded, um, and we are now doing a larger follow-up with 220. Our logic model is that we want to see can our off-the-shelf scalable program um, really improve proximal parenting outcomes as well as adolescent outcomes at the end. And I just want to show that we did improve our interface. It's still very simple. This couldn't be a simpler app. This could be also available via website. Um, but basically, it's just a forum for people to come together and talk. We did also make some new app settings in response to parent feedback in our first one of the coolest is that you can toggle in between English and Spanish uh, to view posts. And so if someone posts in English, it's auto-translated um, and you can actually like respond in Spanish and they'll see it in English, which is really neat. Um, and the great news is parents are using this. We are actively in this study now. I think we've enrolled our first like 30 something patients, um, but we're at a very big clip. We have a recruitment goal of four parents a month. We've been exceeding it wildly since we started here at Northwestern in August. Um, and just recently, a parent posted, hi, I'm new. I appreciate everyone's honest vulnerability. I've been reading the experiences, and I'm astounded by how I felt we were the only ones, although intellectually, I know we're not. I have a coaching session soon, and reading all the comments, questions have provided some relief, relief that I'm not going crazy, and I'm not supposed to be the super strong person who can deal with this and be alone. So as a PI, this, this is like why we do this. It's so lovely to see parents actually engaging with each other, actually using the app, actually helping each other. Um, again, very light touch, very scalable. Um, intervention. Um, and I mentioned business model before. Our hope is that this would actually be a product that residential treatment facilities would purchase as opposed to having parents purchase this. So it would be something that would be offered as part of the intake process as an ancillary treatment for parents if they would like. Um, and it would actually be in the bundled rate for residential services. We are working with the largest residential facility in the country right now, which is Rosecrans Health. They're actually right here in Illinois. So my move here was very convenient because I've been working with them for a long time. Um, and they are very bought into this and interested in actually purchasing this um, at the end of the study. So hopefully that will be something we'll be able to continue. All right, so now I'm gonna take a hard right and give you a very different case example of how might you use digital health products to actually think about helping the workforce to deliver an intervention? So not necessarily just giving an intervention that is digital that patients can use, but to actually layer something in into the actual workflow using a digital health system. This was a project that came out of work that my colleague Caroline Quo was really leading in South Africa um, in to address the HIV epidemic. Um, this Visual here is just to show you that all of South Africa is red. This is basically a heat map of the HIV epidemic to show that South Africa is really at the epicenter. 
And my colleague Caroline has been doing work there for two decades. Um, and basically, uh, I had experience leading a national or regional uh, training and technical assistance center. And in 2017, there was a call for proposals to actually create a training and technical assistance center in South Africa. So my friend Caroline and I partnered thinking, you know, I have expertise leading training and technical assistance center. She has expertise working in South Africa to address HIV. Let's partner together and see if we can help the HIV workforce to learn effective behavioral health treatment. And so this project really came out of that partnership. Um, I really think some of the best science is just an excuse to spend more time with your friends. Um, so this is really um, a kind of a project that is my you know, uh, Valentine's letter uh, to Caroline. But basically, uh, the work we were doing was really centered around the 90-90-90 cat, um, targets for AIDS reduction in South Africa, where which at the time, South Africa was doing decent, having people be aware of their HIV status, where they were really struggling was that only 68% of people that were aware of their status were on HIV treatment. Um, and they also struggled somewhat with getting folks uh, virally suppressed, but it was really this second 90 target that was starting to get a lot of national attention. And it was really coming to their attention that alcohol use was a key driver in this challenge. Um, South Africa has very high rates of alcohol use. It's one of the um, kind of hotspots globally for fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and it's been linked with problems in the HIV care cascade across all of these targets. It increases the likelihood of infection, specifically it really affects retention and treatment and likelihood of seeking care. It also uh, accelerates disease progression. So we really wanted to see if we address alcohol use um, and detection of alcohol use, could we help with the HIV care cascade? But South Africa has unique challenges that I think make digital health um, really interesting to think about. One is just a dire workforce shortage. Over 30% of South Africans experience a mental health issue such as depression, anxiety, or substance use disorder in their lifetime. In fact, our colleagues at University of Cape Town really led the first national prevalence study documenting these rates where they were going door to door throughout the country to really you know, get a handle on what the prevalence was. Um, but there's not many people to treat it. Um, in, Globally, there's usually nine people for every 100,000 people. Um, so there's nine personnel for every 100,000 persons that need mental health. That sounds low to me, but in South Africa, it's 0.08 to 0.89. So for every 100,000 people that need mental health services, there is less than a tenth of person in, on the low end and up to one person on the high end. So just an enormous shortage. For this reason of, of an approach called task shifting has become very popular in South Africa and other low and middle income countries. It's basically a solution to the healthcare workforce shortage by training, um, basically training non-health professionals to train other lay counselors to deliver something. So it helps make the approach scalable by actually using a workforce that isn't your typical workforce. So we're not only relying on, you know, PhD level folks to deliver stuff, we're actually relying on community health workers and folks that are invested in care to really increase the scale of our work. And this was developed, as I mentioned, um, in response to a call to expand training and technical assistance centers um, back in 2017 and funded by SAMHSA and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. At the time, the very first thing we did after we were awarded as a South Africa ATTC was a needs assessment of national stakeholders. These were all the heads of departments of health in each province in South Africa, heads of major NGOs leading HIV service organizations. And we actually asked them, what do you need? What do you need to address the HIV epidemic? And we really heard we need alcohol screening and we need drug screening. And then we need brief interventions once people are uh, noted. So that's really where our desire to focus on alcohol came from, was really from the consumers and, and sorry, the partners themselves. So uh, there was also, right at this time, nationally, a lot of policy momentum. The National Department of Health was um, really interested in this. So we, as part of our new National Training and Technical Assistance Center convened a policy forum focused on screening and brief intervention where we brought together national stakeholders and policymakers. Um, fun fact, I was there on my 40th birthday, so there are some photos of all of us together in South Africa at this really exciting forum. And what really came forward at this national forum is people were like, we need a scalable delivery platform that works in low bandwidth settings, that folks can access in any place, and folks really thought, like, we also need a way to measure this. 
So that's where technology started to be brought up, is can we use digital solutions to actually bring this to scale across the country? So our goals were really to develop a train the trainers implementation strategy that was very scalable and that used technology as integral to the strategy itself. And then we wanted to look at, did we have some indication that this was effective? This was really happening on the national level. So I like to view this as an implementation evaluation study of a national momentum and national initiative that was already going to happen, whether we were on board or not. Um, here's our visual model. Our evidence-based practice was screening and brief intervention. Our strategy was a very scalable train-the-trainer model that used digital tools as integral to the model itself. I'll tell you about it in a moment. And we wanted to look at, first, could we train trainers to a certain level of training fidelity? Like, would they deliver our training materials with fidelity? Could we get them up to a certain level of knowledge that we felt really comfortable in their understanding of the materials? Could they then go on to train providers in a way that would change the provider's attitudes, their confidence, their willingness to deliver this intervention? And would we then actually see reach throughout the country of the screening and brief intervention that we were helping to build their capacity to do? So our first, we spent the first year of this project just developing our scalable train the trainer strategy. Um, our goal was to really create engaging visuals that could be used by folks that had low literacy and that would be totally off the shelf. We had slides if folks had PowerPoint, but we had contingency plans for our contingency plans. Um, my colleague Caroline would always say like, well, what if it's in a rural region, you know, and there's no electricity the day that we get there? You know, so we had like handouts that could be brought that were super friendly. We also had PowerPoint slides. You know, this was really meant to be a scalable training um, a protocol. It was only a couple hours. We also really used technology as integral to the uh, train the trainer approach itself. And I'll be honest, I struggled here when talking to you all of whether to call this an implementation strategy or an implementation delivery platform, because like we ended up delivering the expert through a, tra uh, a technology platform. Um, but I'm calling it part of our strategy because it didn't exist <laughs> before we got there. And so we had an intervention that exists. We had screening tools that had been shown to work in South Africa called the audit and the do it. And our solution was how do we get that into practice? And part of our strategy was we have to bring this onto a technology-based platform or else it's never gonna happen. So we helped, uh, we worked with a partner. We started with one called TBHIV Care. We invested in a system called ComCare and we created a very, easy, user-friendly interface to actually go through these screening tools. Most importantly, we integrated it with what they were already doing. So this wasn't a standalone thing of like, oh, now it's time for me to screen for alcohol. Let me get out my tablet. We moved their entire screening process onto the tablet. So it was something that was actually happening as part of their usual workflow and not an additional thing that they had to do, but truly, truly integrated. We also had a technology training where we trained people on how to use the technology. Um, and we did that both for the master trainers and for the providers. So let me just really quickly give you some signals of does this seem to be working? Our goal here was, could we bring this to scale? And I would say, yes, our initial data is that, yes, we can. Um, we trained only 11 people. Those 11 people went on to train 211 people. Um, in the last, one of our last data draws, they had over 45,000 patients had been screened uh, for alcohol, um, you know, within these HIV service settings. So that's just outstanding. Um, and in fact, my colleague Kira recently sent me some data that but in the last three months, I think another 20,000 patients have been screened. So I don't have those data to show you today, but we're up to about 65,000 screens. So really very, very, very exciting stuff. Um, so let me just show you some of the, the glimpses of what we're seeing here. What we're seeing is that trainers can be trained to very high level of fidelity. So these are trainers without extensive education or background. These are not folks that are your typical efficacy or effectiveness study type of providers. Um, and they're covering 99% of our training elements um, as observed by our team objectively. We had um, someone go out and observe that, you know, did not have, you know, a specific allegiance to our program. So we had research staff trained to observe. Um, very high skill ratings as well. Very excitingly, um, we trained, those folks trained 211 providers. Another 43 providers that we didn't train ended up kind of coming on board to the project later. And just by virtue of using the technological tools that we developed, we're able to kind of jump in and start delivering experts. And what we saw here was just really exciting data. We saw high rates of adoption. Um, Overall, looking at the rate of adoption versus the number of people we train versus the number delivering at the end, it was 85% due to untrained providers coming on board. 
We also saw increases in provider knowledge. Also, this is some of the best retention I've ever seen in a study, and I think it's partly because of this master training cascade model. The master trainers really made relationships with the people they trained and could then help and actually distribute our surveys via WhatsApp um, to the folks that they trained. So, I mean, these retention rates are just outstanding. Um, and so we saw knowledge go up significantly from pre to post training. We saw attitudes. We measured what are people's attitudes toward delivering effort. We saw the attitudes go up. And this was in the 211. So this is not a power issue from the 4,500. This is <laughs> the 45,000. These are just the 211 providers that we train. But we saw confidence um, go up. Uh, some of our attitudes were not significant. We did see that go up, but the attitudes were pretty decent when we started. But we saw confidence go up significantly, which is great. We also saw people's perspective of was this acceptable, feasible, and appropriate in their setting increase over time. I could have a sidebar here that if you are in the implementation science field and use these measures, there tend to be ceiling effects that people always start pretty high. People say like, oh, everything's acceptable, everything's feasible, everything's appropriate. So I did not expect to see much here. And I was delighted that even though we started pretty high on a five point scale, we went even higher over time. So that was very encouraging. Um, and most excitingly, patients are actually being screened. Um, we're seeing enormous numbers of patients being screened, high rates of uh, appropriate screening and brief intervention. So um, just to show that our approach can work, you can do scalable train the trainer models um, and technology can be an integral part of that. So I'm gonna conclude our last few minutes with just a shameless plug of our new center. I have my beautiful mug here, CEDIS, the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science. Um, we were established on August 1st of 2022 and we are really guided by three strategic pillars on a platform that our primary function is really to coordinate the great science that's already happening here where we are at Northwestern, but also in beyond in the field to really help be a nexus of exciting implementation science work. Central to our mission statement is to advance equitable access to evidence-based public health and medical interventions. Because as I mentioned, if you're not implementing with equity first and foremost, you are likely going to heighten disparities and you really need to be intentional about centering equity in your work. And then our three specific goals really align with three specific strategic pillars. The first is scientific leadership. Our goal is to accelerate the impact of research across the translational continuum. The second is support and service. We really want to help train the next generation of DNI public health researchers and practitioners. And as we can say here as friends, webinars like this are great. They're really wonderful for increasing knowledge, familiarity, but often a lot more is needed. So, you know, our hope is to create kind of ongoing touch points, courses, programs that people can come together and really immerse themselves in this way of thinking. And then finally, we want to serve um, as a training and educational hub, um, also somewhat related to the support and service that I uh, talked about before. I feel like those really go hand in hand. We're going to train and educate and also support the people that are doing this important work. Um, within our new center here at Northwestern, we have two brand new center grants, one awarded on August 1st and one awarded on September 30th. These are both funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, drug abuse kind of sidebar stigmatizing language. Um, hopefully that will be changed. It really ought to be persons with drug use disorder, but anytime I say the funder, I always cringe. Um, but the National Institute, I hopefully someday up on drug use and addiction. Um, but one of our programs is uh, based out of Stanford and it's called CDS, um, Center for Dissemination and Implementation at Stanford, and the other is funded as part of a new NIDA Data to Action program. This center, the RAC, is so fun for me because our goal is to work with NIDA-funded grantees that are not planning to do implementation science and help them infuse implementation science thinking into their work, and that's really like where my heart is. I love when folks aren't thinking about implementation science, just being that friendly nudge of like, well, maybe you could just lean in a little bit by thinking about this, or maybe you could lean in a little bit more if you just did this other little thing. So um, if you ever need a friend to encourage you to lean into implementation science, that's my jam. I would be happy to help do that for you. Um, and then on the right here is just a visual of some of the work that guides these two center grants. Um, I think we could probably all agree that in a standard clinical research paradigm, we are often testing interventions and their effect on outcomes. But like the how, the like, you know, which component of our multi-component interventions really drove change is often a black box. Um, I think I and my colleagues at these two centers would argue that in a standard implementation science paradigm, 
we tend to replicate a lot of those same problems. So we take a broader lens, we look at the intervention and its effect on outcomes. We look at a host of other things like our barriers and facilitators, the systems where people work, we look at different outcomes, but the actual how, how does our strategy work? If we have a multi-component strategy like the one I just described, is it the technology that's driving it? Is it the train the trainer materials? Like really specifying and measuring with intention is something we don't do enough in the field. So we are really working in these center grants to really try to advance the, the field of implementation strategy selection, specification, monitoring, fidelity tracking. So that's certainly an area of interest of mine that I'm also happy to talk about during the Q&A. So to end, um, I always like to acknowledge my team and usually I end with a bunch of uh, just names and words, but many of these folks moved across the country with me, either from Brown University where I had spent the last 13 years or folks moved for the opportunity to start a new job and build this new center with me. So I just wanted to show photos of folks that took that leap of faith and were willing to move here. I also have a number of colleagues across some of the projects that we've talked about today. Um, the South Africa project is called ARCH. The um, Parent Smart project came out of both the K23 and an R34 and an R37, most of, most of the folks of which are up here. Um, also do some work with colleagues um, through a network called FIRST, and then I also mentioned the two new center grants. Um, this is just a sampling of some of the active grants we have at CETUS, but these are the specific grants that we talked about today. And I think we uh, met our goal of having about 10 minutes or so for questions. So I will stop share and let David come back and hopefully we can take your Q&A. All right, Sarah, thank you for just a, a fantastic talk. And uh, folks, if you wanna start putting in questions, we already have quite a few uh, and we will get to as many as we can. So uh, start off here from Jeff Reville. Uh, I think this is your earlier intervention. How did you do the translation while sustaining privacy within the environment? Um, did you send it to a third party uh, in the process? I'm not sure what that means. How do you? I think you you mentioned that you had a trans you translated one of the apps into Spanish or the communications back and forth, and so. I think oh, so we actually had a Google a... Uh, plugin. So it's kind of a clunky translation, to be honest, but we orient people to that. So one of the nice things about having a guided intervention is that folks get coaching sessions, um, which again would be part of like a purchasable product. That's how we're viewing our intervention as kind of a, a system that a residential facility could purchase. And as part of that, we provide BA level coaches, um, BA or master's level coaches um, that work with folks and they actually will tell them like, you know, so if you talk to someone in Spanish, you know, be aware that the language might be a little bit broken, but there is this kind of translator that you can just turn on right within the app. Well, so they, they okay. So they choose to turn it on. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I think you sort of answered this next question from uh, Dan Adler, uh, you know, about the, the, the business case. Uh, and so he was basically asking, how do you navigate the tension between a, uh, you know, have, needing a, a coach uh, and, and uh, not being able to integrate that into the care setting? Yeah, Dan, I, like early on in um, my career, when I was writing that R34, uh, we had a talk from the folks at Vermont, uh, Lisa, who directs their big P50, um, focused on behavioral intervention technology, came and gave a talk at Brown, and like overwhelmingly her work was suggesting that using technology as an add-on was the thing that providers mm -hmm. really liked and that patients really liked. Yeah. And so we felt like, so that was kind of in the back of my brain that we know that that's an effective approach. And then when we spoke to the parents, it was so clear that they said, if you just give me an app, um, we won't use it. And I didn't even mention that, but in my preliminary studies for my R34, we tested with eight parents. We just gave them the uh, Parenting Wisely program. No one used it. The modal number of logins was zero. Um, and so having a coach seemed to be a critical way just to get people to even use the app. Um, and so then we really did struggle when designing the study with the residential facility of, should we train your staff to be the coach? And you would actually bill for this and integrate. But they were pretty clear, like, can we just pay more? Um, so that was actually the chief medical officer said, could we just pay to buy this app from you and, you know, have someone in the app that actually would, pr um, would produce the coaching session. See, how we're going to do that is going to be the next phase of our project. So I have the luxury that this was funded as an R37, which means that at 
um, the end of the third year, we apply for an additional five years of stable funding. And 100%, we're going to be testing all delivery strategies, costing, cost effectiveness in that final five years. Because I don't know how to do it just yet, but I feel like that's what we need to do. But I think I think we're seeing that across the board that that uh, you know being able to integrate these the, the having staff take on these extra duties just does not does not function that a lot of companies now are offering the the, right. the, the support services along with the the product. Um, exactly. So uh, another one from uh, from Jeff here. Um, would you agree that the number one implementation objective is to scale delivery, uh, to de-skill, I'm not sure that's what you mean, but the, the human in the loop, so to lower uh, the lower cost carers can be brought online, uh, or do you think it's uh, more important to use digital to scale the productivity of skilled clinicians? I think my bias is probably the latter, um, that I'd love to see digital use to scale the productivity of skilled clinicians and actually bring more skilled clinicians to folks. Um, one of my husband and my good friends, I'm not going to say specifics, but is likely to take a company public soon and make a lot of money bringing inexperienced um, carers to scale. And I debate with her all the time that I'm not sure that's ethical or that that's really helpful. So um, yeah, I can understand the desire to build the capacity, like in South Africa, that was the workforce we had. So we had to build their capacity to deliver interventions, um, but we could do it in a way, we could use technology in a way that helped them to do so with fidelity. I think, you know, when you have access to skilled providers, I'd love to see the technology um, allow the skilled pro providers to increase their productivity as opposed to replacing them. All right, uh, from uh, Jin Shei Lai, uh, could you please define scalable? So. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, I don't know if I can do that justice. Um, one of my colleagues, Lori Descharmes, has this beautiful talk about like scaling in versus scaling out and the differences about them. We have a reading course where we have a whole week um, dedicated to defining scalability. I think I'm going to dodge that question and send David some references to send <laughs> when, the, um, when this is posted, this video there's some really good thought pieces about like what exactly is scalability and what is scaling out versus scaling in. When I use it, I'm just using it in a lay language of like, is this something that we could really be taking to multiple organizations or to multiple places? All right, uh, from uh, William Lever, uh, thanks for a wonderful presentation. You're implementing a brief digital intervention in an academic medical setting. Do you typically recommend using multiple implementation models and frameworks, i.e. FSC for Reaim. That's a great question. We just had our dissemination implementation reading course yesterday, and we had a section on theories, models, and frameworks. And our view is that you know all models are all models are wrong, but some are helpful. Um, and we joke that the only incorrect model is one misapplied. Um, I tend personally to use multiple. So in one of my recent grants, I had used EPIS as a process model. I used CIFR as a determinant model, and then I also um, had re-aim to help think about evaluation. You don't need to use that many models. I usually recommend you know, just thinking about what your goal is. Um, and there's different goals of models. Mm -hmm. You can use models to talk about the process. You can use them to talk about what is actually happening, or you can use them to evaluate. So it's really just understanding what your goal is and then picking the right model. We could, we could talk about that for an hour. All right. Uh, the next question from uh, Jeannie Sawyer uh, Morris. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I appreciate the definitions you provided of dissemination and implementation. How you would, would you define research translation and how is it related to implementation and dissemination? So that's another great question. Our CTSA is really um, working on our renewal actively right now. And so we talk a lot about what is translational research what, versus what is translational science. And then you use the phrase research translation, which I'm not sure exactly what you mean. And if um, you were able to unmute, I would ask you. Um, but we think of translational research as research kind of along the translational continuum that helps you to think about you know, how to improve the process of translation. But then translational science is the how. So it's the how do we move our research like across the continuum as we're moving from efficacy to effectiveness to dissemination and implementation science. So I think of DNI as a key part of translational science. It's the methods of the how we bridge the gap from research to practice. And I would argue if you're 
using DNI principles throughout the translational continuum, it's very much harmonious with what translational science is meant to be. All right. Uh, from Mohammed Hassan, uh, thank you for presenting your work. I wonder if you're able to look at the mechanisms that got uh, activated by the implementation strategies you used. First of all, hi, Mohammed. It's lovely to see you. For those in attendance, Mohammed is a very talented um, student here at Northwestern. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, in the studies that I showed you now, no, because uh, the first study, the digital health, our implementation strategies were really kind of light touch. It was much more that we were trying to create a scalable tool. In the train the trainer, we are not testing mechanisms, but I do recommend doing that. So don't follow my example here. In some of my other studies, um, I have a couple type three hybrid trials. We're very intentional about specifying what the mechanisms are of our implementation strategies and measuring them. Um, in this train the trainer, I mean, I showed you the visual. I would say we kind of believe that provider attitudes, confidence, will kind of be the mechanism. So I'm, I'm kind of not giving my team enough credit. Yes, we would say that the provider outcomes were the mechanisms of change of that, of that process. All right, and then the, the last question so far, um, somebody is looking for you on LinkedIn and can't, uh, Lucy Rinalis is looking for you on LinkedIn and can't find I am, you. to my husband's chagrin, I am not on LinkedIn. Um, I am on Twitter for now. I took like a six week break when it felt <clears throat> depressing in late December and in much of January, but I've been back on the last couple of weeks. You can find me there at, at SJ Becker PhD. Happy to connect. All right. Well, good. And uh, now you can let your husband know that somebody else is bugging you to That's get right. on. <laughs> he's, he's a very heavy LinkedIn user. Yep. Um, so we have, uh, if anybody has any other questions, uh, go ahead and add them, but I will go ahead and uh, go back to one that you had, that you had about, um, uh, oh, and I see Stephen Schuler is always yes, with and Stephen Schuler is always <laughs> with Stephen. us, and we think of him also as still with us. Um, so, uh, you know, you 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 mentioned that you thought that digital tools were better suited to extend the productivity of 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 professionals as opposed to you know doing the kind of um, task shifting. Uh, that that you know obviously is the only mm. alternative in in low income low resource countries, and I'm wondering if you, you know I mean even though the United States in comparison is a high resource country I mean one of the challenges we have in mental health and in substance abuse is you know we don't have and probably never will have enough providers um, and so I'm wondering if you, you know if there if you think that there is a place uh, in our in our mental health care delivery system or in our public health care system for you know utilizing uh, you know I think a lot of potentially you know potentially you know yeah. people who are peers I mean states are beginning to for example uh, you know have accreditation processes for for peer supporters yes I completely agree and I think I was reacting to the language of like, was I interested in supporting um, like untrained people? I think part of why I'm reacting is that my husband works in business. So I see business proposals all the time where people are just trying to make profit off of kind of reducing and watering down the level of expertise that is needed. So I think that was my reaction. I 100% think the digital health tools are a great solution to address workforce shortages, absolutely. And that we should be thinking about using our digital health tools to offload some of the burden and to help people access care more. I just think from the perspective of like for-profit companies, um, if any of them are listening, you know, I'd rather see them investing and in helping improve the productivity of expert clinicians and increasing access to true expertise as opposed to increasing expert access to people that really are not trained for the purposes of cutting costs, which unfortunately I see all the time in the private equity space. So that's yeah. kind of my soapbox there. Yeah, no, I, I completely uh, understand that, that perspective. Um, and so we are at the top of the hour, but there is one more question here, uh, which I think we should get to, which is, uh, does CEDAS already have a list of mentee mentorship programs uh, for those interested? Uh, I have several postdocs uh, reach out to me. This is Laura Kelly. So, um, hi, Laura, a uh, long-term collaborator of mine. Hi, Laura. Okay. So, the Society for Implementation 
research uh, collaboration has one. So rather than us replicate one, we tend to refer people there. It's a really fabulous program. Andrew Graham, um, the co-director of CBIS, um, has was on the board of CERC this last year. Um, and they have a really wonderful um, mentee mentorship program. If you would like to see announcements for programs like that, I recommend people um, subscribe for our listserv. You can email CDIS, C-D-I-S, at northwestern.edu. We have a monthly listserv charmingly called CDIS Monthly, and we have a training and education section where we link to upcoming seminars like CBIS, other things in Northwestern and outside of the community as well. All right, well, we're just past the hour and I can see people are dropping off because they have other things to do. So um, so I'm going to say, Sarah, thank you for just an amazing talk and and good timing since people were asking for implementation science. So so you provided it. Um, folks, just next month, uh, Michael Schoenbaum from the NIMH is going to be talking about viable payment mechanisms for effective digital therapies. And then after that, Joe Glass and Teresa Matson are going to be talking about a, a framework for trial design that's being used within Kaiser Permanente. So stay tuned and join us next month. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.